this computer. Okay, we're recording. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. We, we do have you on mute just so that we can manage a large meeting like this in a somewhat orderly fashion. So thank you for joining us. Um, we do uh, have quite a good amount of attendees. We're at 35 uh, plus three of us panelists. So glad to have you with us. To get a couple uh, business items out of the way. Uh, first one is just the approval of the April 29th meeting minutes. Those were attached as number one. And um, the way that we're gonna do this, the same as last time, if someone can make a uh, motion and, and second by raising hands. Okay, I have two here. Um, Dina, can you see who those are? Yeah, they're at the top, hold on one second. It would be yes. Larry and Dennis. Larry. Uh, motion by Larry, second by Dennis. And I have a poll, if you give me one second. Okay, poll will come up and just click. And I would ask if, if you have multiple people representing uh, your, your membership, just have one of you vote. Um, if you don't represent an agency or have an individual membership or, um, and, and are attending as, as extra, uh, individuals, we, we welcome you, but uh, you don't need to vote. So go ahead and, and vote on that. Dina will compile the results. I need like two more. One more. Okay, we are good. The motion had passed. Okay, thank you, everyone. Moving on to our presentation, Restore Salt Creek. And I'm turning this over to Stephen and Dina. Okay. Um, so we are going to talk about the uh, project Restore Salt Creek. And this, of course, centers around the uh, modification. We're recommending um, removal of the Grawy Mill Dam at the Fullersburg Woods uh, on Salt Creek. So we are going to run through a, some presentation material on this. Uh, I realize um, that uh, a lot of people have already seen this material at various points with the uh, work group, of course, at this point, it's deciding it's not going to uh, show the one particular window that I want it to. Just give me a second here. Of course, it's the last one. Everybody see that okay? Yes, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got used to pausing uh, <laughs> when I asked anything. Um, so this presentation is on the website that Dina will show us in a, in a few minutes. And I'm not going to do this on normal sort of presentation cadence. I'm going to pick out a particular number of things that I think are important to know. But the idea here is to bring all members back up to speed on this particular project, uh, why it's important and what we're doing about it. Um, this project obviously is contentious. Um, obviously, this is... Um, uh, somewhat of a landmark in Oak Brook, um, but there is a huge amount of um, uh, utility bill and taxpayer money resting on it. And the analysis of the creek that we've carried out over the last um, 15 years or so does not show any other project that can have the impact on meeting our permit goals um, that this project has. And it's certainly nothing that is in the same sort of uh, cost benefit uh, universe. So we're all familiar with Salt Creek and that we have a number of plants that drain to it. So the plants, of course, that we're talking about and that will be affected by implementation of the 2004 TMDL are all listed here. Uh, this does include a Bensonville plant, even though that discharges downstream of the creek. Um, a number of years ago, I actually sat down with the village uh, Bensonville staff and the APA as they were trying to put the TMDL um, obligations and the, those were for reductions in CBOD5 and in ammonia uh, on that plant and um, 
we said, well, you know, Bensonville, although it, it, it's discharging downstream of the dam, we are, collect, we are negotiating as a group for a watershed plan, and they are part of that watershed, and so it was offset on that. Of course, the flip side of that would be that um, also the east branch of the Dupage River, if we don't get the dam out, I, I suspect that IEPA would have a case to make that um, the full plan had not been implemented, so all of the plants were, were still on the hook for the lower uh, emission levels um, associated with what the TMDL recommendations were. So from an immediate regulatory point of view, um, this project offsets the 2004 dissolved oxygen TMDL, I'll talk about that in a moment, and it's also in our 2015 special conditions as a priority project. So these are two separate lines of inquiry. The 2004 DO TMDL, uh, we did a separate DO analysis and came up with an alternative plan. Um, and this project was central in that. Um, but the 2015 special conditions was largely built off the uh, analysis of improving aquatic life. So these are two different lines of inquiry that came to the same uh, conclusion. Uh, this is a table uh, taken out of the uh, 2018 303D list. Um, what we've done here is we flagged up in red areas that um, I would put in, in um, relationship to the dam. So either the, the cause, uh, or, or rather, sort of filling up, like the, these were, these little boxes jumping on your screen were for a separate presentation. They don't exactly fit what I want you to take away from here, but I'll still use them to orientate. Uh, so if you go to the right of the first blue box, this is the 303 delisted causes. Uh, you can see there, we have this sediment siltation. Uh, that appears to be large, nearly totally associated with the growing mill dam. Um, it's also in the column after that, the cause column, listed as um, cause of sediment siltation. Um, of course, it also impacts dissolved oxygen, other flow regime alterations. So it's important for us to remember that these are the items that are on the 303D list, and, and they're listed as impacting uh, the biodiversity of the creek, so, and so triggering um, additional permit um uh permit requirements um but there is nothing that the wastewater treatment plant communities can do about sediment siltation and flow regime uh, alterations uh certainly with expenditures we can tweak dissolved oxygen but the ability for us to do that as we know is is uh it's a extremely expensive and technically quite quite limited I am going to, I left this slide in here simply from the, uh, remind me to point out that uh, 2018, uh, we asked Baxter Woodman to again review the cost of implementing uh, the TMDL condition. Uh, they came back with a figure which we've here moved into $2020, uh, which is $2,013 million in capital investments. And these are for the Salt Creek plants. That's the plants we had on the earlier slide alone. It does not extend to the uh, East Branch plants, which would also be impacted by the um, uh, by the uh, East Branch uh, dissolved oxygen TMDL. So this is strictly the Salt Creek um, plants. Now, a couple of things that is capital investment, and it is for the ammonia and BOD uh, reductions. This is not talking about total phosphorus. That is a totally different um, set of set of costs. Uh, so this is based. That figure is based simply on the TMDL dissolved oxygen um, 2004 recommendations. Here is the uh, table uh, of scenarios that the 2004 TMDL uh, ran. Um, now, uh, in, in discussions with people who, are, um, who don't like this proposal, um, they often point out, well, 2004 is a long time ago. Um, you know, that, that is uh, you know, 16 years ago. And everything, but you should point out that there's, there's, you know, there has been some changes in the creek, but nothing that would suggest that, that the, that the, uh, the TMDL or our own modeling work is, is dated uh, in, um, in any way. But this is the TMDL that has been approved. Um, t uh, and so the IEPA does have the authority to, uh, to push this into, uh, into our wastewater permits. Um, IEPA have agreed in writing that the model is fatally flawed. And once again, it, the, the principal flaw is that it used loadings um, from the uh, permit allocation. In other words, it assumed that all of the plants were using their 
full permit allocation, when in fact uh, they operate at a, a fraction of that, and that the recommendations that they come out with were only a little below what the, uh, uh, the recommendations were. In, in other words, plants were actually, um, the loadings coming out of the plant were actually quite close to the TMDL uh, recommendation. Now, that sounds like initially sounds like a good thing, but of course, uh, if, if we lower the, the permit uh, limit, then the plants all still need to go down further in order to maintain uh, their margin of safety to prevent any permit allocations. Uh, and on the um, and from the modeling perspective, it means that we're we're giving some a lot of the allocation of the dissolved oxygen problem. We're explaining it on the back of wastewater treatment plants when in fact the actual loading of wastewater treatment plants cannot explain it. That also means we the the the, the 2004 model is telling us that the plants can do more to clean this up than they actually uh, they actually can because they're over um, they're over describing the problem on the basis of an overestimation of what plants were actually putting into the river. Again, IEPA has already agreed to this problem in writing, and that is when they allowed us to move forward with developing our own model. This is our model I put here. This is what we're calling our baseline model, which is to the uh, sort of 7Q10 condition. Um, this was based off a highly validated and calibrated model. The Fullersburg Wood Grand Mill Dam is shown by the red arrow to the right of your screen. And you can see there that we are predicting that is where the biggest dissolved oxygen dip would be during these conditions. And that is due to uh, alteration of flow and the high sediment oxygen demand caused by the sediment bed behind, uh, behind the dam. As well as, of course, the, the higher algae, uh, algae growth uh, encountered in an impoundment like that. And that is, of course, what we're actually observing. Um, okay, so that is dissolved oxygen. Of course, we have a second line of inquiry, which is our biodiversity um, improvement. All this comes out of our uh, IPS modeling and our bio, our basin bioassessments. Um, this is Salt Creek here. The dam is shown by the red arrow um, at the, um, along the bottom of the x-axis. It's the triangle E. You can see here we get this bulge in fish. Uh, running, in fact, we're sort of in the uh, 25 to 30 category, uh, most of our surveys, and that falls off to around uh, 15 as we move upstream of the dam. And um, so this represents a, a fall in fish species of 16 native species. Uh, we'll look at those species in a moment. Um, but again, the question comes down to, quite frankly, we are being told that, that upgrading our wastewater treatment facilities from um, uh, Bensonville all the way up to um, the Egan plant uh, will somehow improve this, uh, this, divert, this uh, spread of, of fish species in Salt Creek. Once again, that's obviously not true, um, but if we can remove the dam and get these fish species to move upstream, it will obviously be in the long term just, just the biggest shot in the arm that we can possibly give to meeting the aquatic life goal of the, of the Clean Water Act. So um, the, the, there's 18 species in the column to your left. They are the 16 species that I'm talking about plus two um, non-native ones, um, but, I, but I'm including in there for um, information's sake. Uh, but you can see a lot, a lot of these species are, are very high value. Uh, if we can get them up around Elmhurst, up into Addison, uh, their impacts on our fish IBA there would be um, uh, very large uh, because, of course, the IBI becomes increasingly weighted uh, as a, uh, a fish species move up into a smaller and smaller drainage areas. It, its impact on the IBI multiplier, its IBI multiplier uh, becomes greater. Uh, interestingly enough, um, there's a second column there, upstream of the dam only. So we've got this central mud minnow and brook silverside, and we're finding them upstream of the dam only. Now, obviously, it's a much smaller number of fish, but there's also no reason to believe that these fish won't spread downstream. So increasing the downstream IBIs um, also, obviously, in terms of number and the IBI multiplier, it'll be a smaller impact. Now, this is a phenomena that we observe also at the, at the Faywell Dam on the West Branch. Um, we didn't observe it at Churchill Woods, and there were no species upstream of that. Well, I, I guess there were some mosquito fish, but that's not a, a not native species, and they were released, obviously, to, uh, to uh, consume mosquito larvae. 
Um, but uh, just interesting that we're seeing these sort of perched populations um, as well. Uh, we were using these two images just to illustrate the kinds of fish that we're getting. Of course, uh, I, uh, the charismatic megafauna, in terms of the, the northern pike, that, that fish was caught nearly directly downstream off the Grawy Mill Dam, does not appear anywhere upstream off the dam. And then the other character that's worth pointing out here is this long-nosed gar. Uh, we had one individual that we found in 2016. It's notable because we never find that fish, there's no record of that fish in Salt Creek from any of the previous studies, either our own or anyone else. Um, it seems to be, the hypothesis is, uh, the most plausible hypothesis is it arrived because of the removal of the Hoffman Dam on the uh, Des Plaines River. So it moved upstream there and then moved up Salt Creek until it ran into the barrier of the uh, Grawy Mill Dam. So just a couple other things worth, worth noting. Um, this is the macroinvertebrate IBI. Uh, so once again, mark the dam in the red arrow and the, we're moving from the Des Plaines River at zero on our x-axis on the right of your screen to the headwaters of the uh, of Salt Creek um, at uh, mile 40 on the uh, left-hand side of the graph. So the yellow box running through the middle is the sort of good category, as a, it, well, it is the category where we're moving into the area of obtaining um, aquatic life. Now we want to be in the upper boundary of that um, at 40, but you can score lower than that if you have a, a fish population. But this does show that downstream of the dam, um, we have a very robust um, macroinvertebrate population. Um, but once again, I just want you to note how much that crashes once we hit the dam. And it doesn't recover until we're up around, uh, uh, around mile 17, 18. Um, now, the reasons for that are not a mystery. The reasons for that are um, the, the habitat that is destroyed by the dam. Some of it is low dissolved oxygen, but the majority of it nearly certainly is the sedimentation of habitats, the alteration of flow regimes, uh, the destruction of uh, uh, stream, in-stream vegetation. Um, again, the expenditure of the $2,013 million at wastewater treatment facilities will do nothing for any of that. Uh, the, the stream water quality downstream of the dam is not notably um, better outside of, uh, of dissolved oxygen, et cetera, than it is um, in the uh, dam employment area in terms of full spectrum chemistry. But clearly, we're st you know, it's the same water. It just goes up in the dam, goes over the top of the dam. But um, we are not seeing, um, we're still se we're seeing in that area that, in fact, aqu uh, the aquatic habitat or the aquatic uh, macroinvertebrates uh, seem quite healthy. I'd also invite you to look around mile 20 there. Um, where you can again see that you know we're getting very close uh, to uh, to meeting that goal. That is, you know, if you look above at the at the very top line of this graphic, you can see the triangles there representing dischargers. That's our wastewater treatment facilities. So uh, seven and eight there. That is the Elmhurst plant and the um, uh, Salt Creek um, Cemetery District plant. Those plants are discharging right there. And we've still got this uh, macroinvertebrate bulge, um, the, you know, where it's it's getting pretty close to the forty. Uh, this, the the distribution of 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 good biodiversity for macroinvertebrates on Salt Creek is not well explained by uh, wastewater effluent. It is best explained by this graphic, which is aquatic habitat. And the primary factor driving aquatic habitat in Salt Creek is the Grawl Mill Dam, which again you can see the bulge here. A little red arrow on again. Again, here you can see the fall off. So what I want everyone to take away from this is the expenditure of the two, $213 million will not improve the macroinvertebrate scores on Salt Creek, will not improve the fish scores on Salt Creek. It will perhaps marginally improve the dissolved oxygen on Salt Creek, um, and it will not improve the aquatic habitat. The EO model we looked at earlier, one of the things that we did with it was that we, um, we set the um, BOD and ammonia to zero on that 
uh, model while maintaining flow from the plant. So that's if a, flamp, a plant was putting out X million gallons a day in flow, it continued to put out X million gallons a day in flow, but we removed the BOD and ammonia uh, compounds from it. Um, we still could not hit the dissolved oxygen goal upstream of the ground mill dam. That is not to say that the plants cannot affect dissolved oxygen on Salt Creek, they can, but only at enormous cost, and it's a one-trick pony. It will only improve DO. Removal of the dam will improve DO very cost-effectively. It'll improve habitat remarkably. We've already seen at Oak Meadows that we were able to change the habitat from there, move it from one of the lowest scores it was down around, the growing mill kind of level. It is now meeting the aquatic life goal uh, for macroinvertebrates. And based on our Churchill Woods experience and the experience of other dams moved in the area, we can see that we can very quickly reestablish these fish populations. So the, um, the environmental benefit and the regulatory benefit of removal of the dam is, is very, we're very high confidence, it's very predictable, and it's, it hits multiple fronts on our MS4 and our wastewater permits. So this table uh, we had put together recently to be able to sort of uh, easily kind of look at the costs and benefits uh, of this. Um, so you can see on our uh, on the area with the yellow box here, we're looking at dam modification, sewage, sewage treatment plant upgrades, in-stream aeration, two ver variants of that, air-based and high uh, purity oxygen. And we also had dredging the impoundment and fish ladder. Um, and then what we have here is ticks showing which one of these, are, or rather, we have the cost here in the orange box, and then we have, you know, which of our um, permit environmental goals are, are we hitting? I, I say permit environmental goals here, just to remind you that they're both out there, but the, those two are very highly integrated, just to the way the law is written, which is a good thing. So again, just noting that we're thinking we can do this, the dam modification and this restoration of the stream corridor for a mile upstream of the dam, that we can do this for the four to five million dollar range. Treatment plant upgrades, based on that 2018 report, we're looking at 200 million in capital upgrades and a marginal increase in operating costs in the seven to eight million dollars a year range in 2020 dollars. Um, Air-based, uh, of course, in the uh, we're looking in the two to three million dollar range. Dredging based on past experience, uh, and this is based on clean fill, we're looking at eight million. And fish ladder, such as what we're looking at uh, in uh, Faywell, um, you know, we're looking at in the two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollar range. However, each one of these only hits one of the items that permit holders need to have corrected on Salt Creek or ameliorated on Salt Creek. Um, the removal of the dam hits all of them and does so in an extremely cost-effective way. Also think it's worth time members, um, if they're involved in this discussion, do remember that uh, the dam is heavily silted. This is actually a drawdown of the dam from 2018, I believe, to drone footage. The dam is on your left. As you look towards the road crossing the river, you move your eyes just down a little bit, you will see the dam spanning the river there. It's completely exposed at this time because the water is going through the emergency spillway at the left of the river system there. You can see the white water caused by it um, down. But uh, what I want you to look at here is this red arrow, which shows this mudflat that is forming. Um, it, it, back in the 1990s, before the dredging was done, there were actually trees growing in this part of the river. Uh, the dredging removed all of that. Um, but the, the site is silting in. Um, there is also extensive uh, mud beds here. At the, this is the mouth of the raceway to the Grime Mill Dam, which you can see the building there. Um, so if the dam project does not, was not to go ahead, uh, the Forest Preserve would still be left with this, with this issue. And of course, you know, it's, at some point, this simply becomes a, a more and more stagnant pond with sluggish water moving in a river form through the dam. and. Um, uh, you know, water doesn't really pass through the raceway with any frequency as it stands. And of course, as this mud bed continues to, or silt bed continues to accumulate, that will become uh, less and less uh, frequent. I don't believe there are funds available at the Forest Preserve or at any other point or place to do the dredging. And obviously, that is something that we have said that we would not, outside the context of 
a removal of the structure we would not be uh, assisting with. Uh, this is just a close-up of the dam once again in the employment looking south towards the dam you get an idea of the water quality and and one of the i think the items that is just useful to point out is that we can treat this water to any level that people want for if if there's sufficient funds and we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars but it will not mean that the stream corridor itself stays within water quality standards if these waterways are damaged they will damage the affluent that is coming into them and the, the chemistry will begin to revert to falling beneath the state water quality standards. And just wanted to run through these items before handing over to Dina to talk about the public meetings. Every dam removal project I've worked on, um, had, these have come up. Won't mosquitoes increase? Obviously mosquitoes will not increase. We're removing standing water. Uh, where it's just where mosquitoes breed. Increasing the fish population will also mean predation on mosquito larva will increase. Uh, so that is not, uh, not the case. Will mud flats increase? Temporarily after the project, mud, uh, these mud flat areas like we saw in that drawdown image will be uh, exposed. Uh, however, all of our projects, um, either, either partners in county stormwater or with uh, forest preserve, all of these uh, beds are, there's a full planting plan. Uh, take them in to um, get them planted, uh, beautified, uh, make them part of the habitat uh, structure to support the aquatic life in the stream. There is um, ready evidence from existing projects. Won't flooding increase? This project will fall under DuPage County, which is one of the most comprehensive um, flooding uh, ordinances and, and floodplain management ordinances in the whole state. Um, no flooding will not increase under this project. And the last one, the river will disappear after you take this out. This appears to be, people are talking about that the impoundment will shrink. And yes, it will become a river as opposed to a, a, an impoundment. Um, however, the river has its, its own uh, water value. Um, the, the rock riffle uh, will be a water feature, which will also give the sound of rushing water and will create a visual and audible uh, audio feature. Um, it, it'll be a different water feature. But as we've seen before, um, you know, the, the water quality within the impoundment is very poor. It is a source of odors. Um, all of that will be eliminated um, by the project as we have proposed it. And with that, I am, um, Dean, I don't know if we're seeing if there were any questions that came up on any of that. Sorry, um, I, there are, have been no questions so far. So if somebody anybody okay. has any questions, if they could please go ahead and they can use the Q&A or the chat. I have both of them open, so, or if you would like to speak, you can raise your hand and then I can turn your mic on. While we are waiting to see if anyone has any questions, I'm going yeah. to take over Stephen's screen. Yeah, I'll stop share sharing. something. And I would encourage any members who have questions about this or any item that they want to discuss to either call Dina or myself. Uh, we have been working, this has been the principal use of our time over the last three to four weeks. Um, this the project did come to the fore because there was a non-DRSCW affiliated uh, person out in the community who got into a, uh, um, seems like an online debate about this, and this has triggered a lot of interest in this project. And um, so we have been, had to reorientate a little bit, a lot of our materials to um, to, to join this online discussion as opposed to being the, uh, the public meetings which we were hoping to um, uh, would be the kickoff of this discussion. But that's, that's just the way it is. Okay, so Stephen kind of gave all the background about why we were looking to modify the dam at Rowey Mill. So the next step was after we did all the science and things like that, that investigate in the alternatives analysis that looked at those options, those sort of mechanical type options that Stephen talked about, we wanted to look at, uh, we did a we're start, we're in the middle and we've been working for the last over a year on a master plan um, with our consultant AECOM to do an alternatives analysis about what the project would look like on the ground. So before I show you what we ended up with our final choices, I wanted to re remind you guys that we didn't just go and jump straight. We knew that from our analysis that we needed to work on water quality improvements by removing the, the function of the impoundment. So moving back to more of a natural river system. And we knew we needed fish passage through the dam structure. 
So we didn't jump into just removing the, the dam all in its entirety. We went through an entire process where we did the analysis to find out what are the other options. Is there a partial removal of you know, other types of things that we could do on the, in, in, at the site that would meet those goals. So we have those, Stephen, we have those goals. We were looking at the fish passage, the improvement in water quality, especially around the DO, and the improvement of the macroinvertebrates through the impoundment. And so we started back last summer with AECOM and we did an entire um, field survey of the entire project site, starting at York Road, which is just south downstream of the dam, all the way up to 31st Street, where we did a topographic survey. We did a Waters of the U.S. survey. And then we also did sediment sampling and depth of refusal and a bathymetric survey of the impoundment. So we have a really good idea of what the lay of the land is out there. Because we wanted to make sure that we could run preliminary modeling to actually figure out how wide the creek is going to be, what the, where the creek is going to move when the dam gets removed or modified, and so forth. So the pictures that I'm going to show you are actually based on um, data that was collected at the site and are not just artistic, they, well, they're artistic renderings, but they're not just plain artistic renderings. They're based on scientific data and survey data that makes us feel very confident that this is what the site will look like. So, we looked at, we talked to the consultants, the projects committee worked very hard coming up with different alternatives that they wanted AECOM to look at. And I'm gonna show you um, two of those main ones and then we'll show the selected alternative because we knew that with the tie of the mill being there and the raceway, we wanted to see what we could do to keep water flow, that hydraulic connection to the raceway through the project. And if there was a way to keep a portion of the dam on site in the stream, um, so that that tie is still there um, to the adjacent mill. So one of the things we looked at was potentially just leaving port, a port, leaving the bottom half of the dam a crest reduction, pretty much. So we're going to talk talked about doing is removing two feet, and this is what this this is what this. Let me turn on my annotate. Um, but that's this is what this drawing um, shows is the um, is a crest reduction of the dam, and as you can see um, that. We still, when we do this, we do get a narrowing of the, uh, of the impoundment because pretty much all of this green vegetation on the sites, this is that mud flat Stephen was talking about, would obviously become land and no longer um, partially submerged or a mud flat. We do, uh, when we do this type of project, we still lose hydraulic connection to the mill race. So we did not meet that goal or that hopefully expectation of the project. We also end up with a structure that includes a lot of what they um, call this with this rock ramp. So what we would be doing is just adding rock to the to the stream and helping um, stabilize that rock with these um, weirs or these rock weirs in order to meet the grade from the upstream to the downstream. The impoundment, even though it is narrower, it is still there. We would not get the expected water quality benefits we would have. We would still have significant DO issues in the impoundment as well as the resulting algae and other issues that we are currently seeing. And the velocities that are modeled through this rock ripple are really not low enough to get all the features that we are looking to, to move up. All the, all the fish and the velocities are not low enough through this structure to get all the fish passage that we're looking for. Some of the bigger fish, like you know, the northern pike would be able to move up, but some of those critical smaller species would not be able to move up through this system. The system also has significant maintenance issues. It does not completely alleviate, alleviate the need for future dredging on the site because we would still have um, a part of the dam and sediment would still continue to get trapped. So there would be a long-term maintenance to the forest preserve that they would still need to budget funds or find funds to dredge because eventually this would eventually silt in and um, cause problems. These rock weirs are also fairly um, significantly unstable with the storm events that we have in Salt Creek. There is some worry that debris and trees and other things that come down during storm events would get lodged in. So we would need continual maintenance of these structures as well as the rock could move. And so we would not only need the debris and the tree lar trees cleaned out of these structures, but they would also potentially need to be replaced. So you can see that it didn't meet our project goals of improving water quality. Um, the macro issue was still not, was not resolved because of um, it was still an impoundment and not a free flowing stream and we didn't fully get the fish passage. So this alternative was not chosen for those reasons, as well as all the increased maintenance costs. So one of the other things that was talked about over and over again was, was there a possibility, because we've seen this in some projects, of leaving portion of the dam in place. And this drawing is done with the dam being removed in on the stream, the other side of the stream that the mill is on, because the mill is over here, but it could be done either way. 
But what you end up with with this structure is you end up with something that I just don't find is very appealing. Um, in order to, to stabilize and ensure the integrity of the dam, we needed to construct this, um, this rock wall, this actually concrete wall structure to divide the creek. The impoundment does not change at all, as you can see. So we still have the water quality issues and the dredging issues there. The velocities through this second rock ramp are not, they're even worse than the previous one I showed. So we're gonna lose less um, features. And obviously you can see there's this similar maintenance there. And also with this rock wall and this stone wall, this concrete wall is gonna require a lot of inspection and maintenance because we gotta, it's gotta maintain its integrity. And so for all of those reasons, it's the same thing that this, this section wasn't, um, wasn't chosen. And even with this option, we still, pretty much lost the hydraulic connection with the mill, um, with the mill race. The mill race, if you can look at the bottom, where you have the dam and the mill race, the mill race is significantly shallower than the dam, so it's very easy. Um, any sort of, any minor drop in water level really cuts off that mill race. And we can talk more about the mill race and the history of the mill race um, later, on in the, later on in the presentation if you have questions on that. We have learned a ton about the mill race and how it functions and how it operates. And I know that's a big um, big point of interest for some of the general public. So we can talk through some of those pros and cons later. But really there was no positive to this, um, to this um, solution, except for maybe we left a part of the dam. Um, so once again, we chose to um, not go with this issue and to move forward. We talked about all different types of opportunities with AECOM and the projects committee and no one really had any other creative ideas. So of course, what we ended up settling on was a full removal of the dam. And the full removal of the dam meets all of our project goals as Stephen laid out. The upstream impoundment will be returned to a river channel. Um, we will have this rock riffle structure that will allow um, velocities low enough to allow fish passage of even those small species. Um, and it, it, we get that habitat for the macroinvertebrates um, throughout that corridor. It is important to note out that obviously when we do this, we will lose that hydraulic connection um, to that mill raise. So this is the project and it meets all of our goals. Um, and this is how we ended up with the final solution that a modification of the dam was not appropriate for us but a dam removal was appropriate for us. So then we did a couple of bunch of work to figure out what we could also do at the site in order to encourage, um, in order to help improve, uh, improve issues on the site. Um, so, you know, we talked with the Forest Preserve about improving access. Obviously this provides a great feature for kayaking and canoeing. Um, you have the recreational opportunities that are no longer, um, that are currently not available at the site through a project like this. So I'm just gonna quickly show some rendering, some like current and future proposed conditions and um, kind of go through those so that you can see them. And these are the, what we're using um, to show with the project. So here's looking from the, from it's like kind of a, it's like a weird way, but from the east or north bank, looking across towards the mill, you can see here's the existing um, with the dam. And then, you know, this is what it would look like um, post project. And we're fairly confident that this is realistically about the width of the stream. I mean, it does get a little bit narrower um, because we do lose that impoundment, but we're still looking at a pretty wide um, stream, you know, ranging throughout the project site, which is a one mile corridor up um, through Floresburg from widths of 70 to, you know, 120 feet. So it's not going to be a 12 feet wide. It's not going to turn into a backyard small creek. It is still going to be a major river. It's gonna look very similar to like, if you stand at the dam now and look downstream, that's what it will look like upstream, you know, with some variance. Um, so we have, so this is sort of like the overall project scope. You know, we're gonna have some fishing path, some path, aspects path and stuff, because now that the dam has been removed, there's safe access to the creek. The ripple will be a great feature for not only playing and canoeing, but also for fishing. So we're gonna bring, bring some safe access down because that safety hazard um, of the dam is no longer there. So here's looking at the mill from the mill side um, towards the mill building. And so as we've talked about before is that currently this mill race extends, extends on this side, you know, does extend to the creek. And Stephen showed how that area is significantly set it, set, sedimented in. And the mill race gets full of sediment and needs to be periodically cleaned um, and back trucked by the forest preserve. So it's sort of a two phase process. They have the rangers who have to come in there, you know, weekly or monthly and, you know, actually get out the trash because there is trash and other things that get accumulated in the raceway. 
and then periodically they do need to bring a back truck out and back truck it out. So you have the mill race here. So what we we've, we've talked about, we have a couple alternatives. I only have one rendering to show you today, but we will have more. Um, we're getting developed now. Is that the, since the raceway is going to be cut off from the mill race, we can do many things with it. We can. Um, as this one shows, we could actually fill in part of the mill race. I mean, the mill race is still existing near the building, so you still have that tie and get more land for picnics or um, gatherings or things like that. We could also pretty much just leave it as is and close it off near the end. It would um, hydraulically disconnect it from the creek, but we're looking at and investigating ways to keep water in the mill race. And there are many different ways that that can be done. It can be done by just using a potable water source that fills it, you know, when it drains down or, you know, when it needs more water, we just turn on the hose and we can refill it. We've talked about recirculating pumps to actually pump creek water from downstream up into the mill race and to keep that. So it does, so around the mill it will look like it does currently, except we will have limit, we will have the maintenance issue because there will be no longer a way to get sediment and um, trash, you know, unless someone's throwing trash in it over this fence, there'll be limited debris and things like that getting into it. So we're still working on different renderings and different opportunities for the mill race. One of the things we wanted to show is if you're standing at the mill building looking at the dam, <clears throat> this is what it currently looks like. Um, what could that look like in the future? Um, this rendering shows that. You'd still have a beautiful water feature with the rock riffle and the things, and there, we could actually do some more with some paths and some vegetation and picnic areas and things like that at the site. The downstream side of the mill race, so here's the mill building, and so the water would be flowing this way. You can see the dam in the background. We are proposing no changes at all. Um, to this side of the mill race, it would say completely as it is. And this is what it would look like pretty much how it is now, except for instead of the dam being in the background, you'd have the rock riffle feature um, and the mill race would look uh, very similar. And that's um, the renderings um, of the actual dam site. But I think it's also important to note, and I'm sorry that these are in like an odd order, but it's also important to note that this is not just a dam project. The dam is here. But this project investigates the entire corridor of Salt Creek through Floresburg Woods. It's about 1.2 miles long. Um, this is, if you know the site, this is the Rainbow Bridge here. This is Flatbridge, and this, this is the Nature Center. So you can see we're looking at opportunities to do restoration through that entire 1.2 mile section. And we'll be using the same practices for restoration that we have at all of our other projects, things like root wads, stream bank stabilization, creation of smaller ripples and pools using the improvement of the bed substrate. There's some really great bed substrate through here if you can get underneath the sediment that's been accumulated in the impoundment just by the portion of the dam. So we're hoping that once we can get that, once we are able to remove the dam and remove some of that sediment, we'll expose some natural creek bed that's through here, but we'll also be looking at opportunities to enhance that in other areas. Obviously creation of backwater habitat, reconnection to the floodplain, and obviously all areas that are currently, you can see all this light green are things that are currently underwater or partially, um, partially submerged during times of the year would become hot, more dry, we would be looking to restore those. We're not leaving mud flats or creating mud flats. Obviously at all of our other projects, we have seen this and we always come back in and do vegetation management for you know three to five to 10 years at post project construction in order to ensure that that vegetation is healthy and established. We went beyond just ecological efforts. We, opportunities, we looked for improvements and recreational opportunities. Obviously with this beautiful nature center, they have a lot of programming. At the site, we wanted to be able to take that on. Um, currently, because of the presence of the impoundment, the water depth, um, the presence of some of these mud flats that do show up during this time of the year at the, um, at the um, nature center, um, there's not a lot of direct access to the creek to get people who are coming to the nature center down into the creek. They can look at it and view it from um, like sort of behind a wall over here, but we looked at opportunities of getting them, uh, getting access like fishing piers and stuff like that. So educational programmers would be able to take the kids into the creek. There's an existing canoe launch we're looking at doing some improvements on. Um, right now they do a little bit of canoeing and programming where they get folks in and they obviously just sort of paddle around and then they get back out. But with the dam removed, you'll be able to actually paddle through the section. So we're not only looking to improve the canoe launch up here, but actually adding a canoe launch, a kayak launch, down on the other side of York Road at the existing parking lot. So people who are paddling through could get out and then walk around and see the former project site and see the history that is at the Growlia Mill. So it'd be another opportunity to bring people to the site um, that goes just beyond you know, driving in and parking in to get to the mill. It's also to note that 
Salt Creek is an official paddle trail, but this section of the creek is not listed as part of that paddle trail because of the presence of the dam. So by removing the dam, we'll also be able to add this section back into its national, tra national um, paddle trail um, connectivity. And so it'll be a great opportunity for um, those who do like to use and recreate along Salt Creek. So these are the project, these are the project renderings. And so if anyone has any questions on those, they can answer those now. I think I have a question. So some so Scott has asked what effect if any of the dam removal will have on downstream flooding events. Stephen, do you want to finish that? You want to re you're muted, Stephen. Okay. So Dina, the question was. On what Don effect will the dam removal have on downstream flooding events? Okay, so the the um, the dam itself is not a flood control structure, so it is a, a passive structure, um, and you do get a buildup of water behind it. Um, so it, it's it's effects on uh, either improving or um, or making flooding worse, and realize that's a complex question. Uh, uh, if if nothing was done to um, to ameliorate either side of that, you know, its it, its impacts would be extremely extremely small in, in either direction. As it stands, uh, because of the uh, permitting in DuPage County, this removal of this structure cannot uh, increase downstream water levels um, in any way under um, under any of the flood conditions, or at least it, it cannot do so in any kind of um, a meaningful way. Um, so. So that's the short answer is that the, the riffle area and the upstream riffles will be constructed in such a way um, that the um, during um, our range of uh, design storms, uh, flood elevations downstream will not, not be increased. Now, based on modeling of the previous low head dams were coming out, it looks as if there would be some small decrease in flood elevations in smaller storms. We're talking one to two year storms here. So there will be some localized small improvement in that just based on our past experience and of course the modeling for the project would confirm if that remains the case here but in terms of that specific question there will be no uh no change to downstream flood elevations um during storm events okay so we've kind of said it over and over again so as i mean we have our, you know, our final design here. This is the rendering we've been using in a lot of our promotional materials. You know, this is the goal that meets all three or four of our project goals. Um, and we think it actually looks quite beautiful. So um, if you have any questions about the renderings or the process that we went through on these, or you have any suggestions for future render or other renderings that you think might be helpful as you're talking about the project, just reach out to me. We do have a couple different renderings in, um, in development now that I don't have, I hope to have by the end of this week, we're looking at like a typical stream segment, we're looking at some different rendering and some different renderings around alternatives for the raceway. Um, I guess we can come back to the raceway discussion after I get through all this and then. Yeah, Dina, I, I did a, I, I had something else I just wanna throw in about that flooding item. That comes up in every dam removal project uh, we've been involved with and also it came up in all the removal projects that the, the county worked on. Um, you know, people see this pond of water behind the dam and they think that the dam is holding that there and if we release that into the system, um, that it's going to cause, you know, cause flooding. That's, that's not the way hydraulic systems operate. Another way to think about it is, well, you know, here, this, this is 16 acres. If it's all a foot deep, that's 16 acre feet of, um, of floodplain that we have pre-flooded. So that is areas that we could flood in a storm, but it's already flooded. So we've already, it's dead storage, essentially. So we're, we're freeing that up. And that's why I say some of these smaller storms. But, but, but everyone on the call should be aware that that question is going to get asked again, again, and again. We have to be patient in explaining it. You can go right to the permits and say that, you know, there are people whose only job in life is to make sure that these projects don't do things like that. And they are completely independent of us. And they will be checking all of our our data and uh, analysis and outputs to make sure that we're um, we're abiding by the rules. And just to add to that, Stephen, uh, as typical of a broad crest uh, weir, yeah, there is no attenuation, there's no V-notch, there's no restriction of culverts, so there is no bump in the flood elevation. Uh, so that you know, hydraulically, it makes sense to those of us who have have worked with modeling, but 
for some reason it's not intuitive to the general public, but um, you know, so uh, hopefully people will will learn more once they go to restoresaltcreek.org. If you haven't already done so, uh, all of you members, send an email to your president, your board, your manager, uh, give them the basic information and remind them of the main points of why we need to do this and get them to visit that web page. This petition that's online, it's at change.org. Uh, they're saying that they have nearly 9,000 people mm -hmm. who've signed it now. Um, it's kind of an impassioned paragraph that they put up there. It, it kind of implies that the, the Growy Mill is being um, impacted also. And like Dina was saying, there's nothing but improvements that we're looking to do here. So um, that this rendering that's on the screen right now is, is on that uh, restoresaltcreek.org website right now. Yeah. The other renderings are not yet. No, but I, I think this one in particular is just useful on its own. Yeah. And I'll, I mean, I'm going to walk you guys through that stuff. This is just sort of like laying the land. We wanted to show you guys that people are saying that it's always been our intent. We just want to take out the dam. That was our main goal. And I just, we wanted to show you that we did have a systematic process. We looked at all sorts of options that didn't involve changing the dam. And then we looked at alternatives with the dam. And we've also experimented and looked at lots of opportunities throughout the site in order to help you know, find other opportunity, you know, the dam removal, and there are people who are very tied to that dam, but there are also other opportunities on the site that are removal offers that are not there existing. We have been trying to be, do a comprehensive plan that sort of looks at all those alternatives. And so um, if you have any questions about that process, you can let me know. I'm going to move into a different presentation and kind of tell you guys where we are and what we're doing and what's going on now um, with the public outreach. Um, so we talked a little bit about this last time, and sorry, it's like trying to get through all this, and I know it's clunky, <laughs> sorry. So hopefully you're looking at a screen right now that has sort of the outline. So as Dave mentioned, is there are actually three petitions that are out there currently. So there is a, there is a petition that is against the project, and there are two different petitions. There's one on change.org, and then there's one that is, I believe, on the actual Sierra Club site that are supportive of the project. But what we are trying to do through this, through our outreach process is to get out the information about the facts of the project, sort of what we walked through today. Where are the, what are the environmental benefits of the project? Where are the economic impacts of not doing the project? The process we went through, this wasn't something we did quickly. This wasn't something that we, you know, just dreamed up one day and hired to get beautiful renderings. We've actually done the work and a lot of science and engineering behind our work in order to be able to show that we feel that this is a strong and the only solution um, for the issues we're seeing in Salt Creek. So we're gonna be presenting um, some information during, obviously because of COVID, and we have tried to have these meetings in April, May, and June. Um, we're looking at hosting some virtual public houses in July. They are the 7th and 9th, and the times are here. Um, and after the 7th, what we'll be doing is posting a recorded version of the, of the video on the website so people who couldn't attend the meeting to actually view what was said at the meetings when information was presented. It'll be very similar to what Stephen and I have presented here today, just sort of in a, a briefer format because we want to make sure that we're not holding people, you know, for an entire hour. Once we hold those virtual public open houses, we have to, we're going to be doing a public comment period. And that public comment period will be open for about 30 days. And what it will be is it'll be done via a survey or a survey monkey form that'll be accessed via the website that people who watch the open house and to go through and answer some questions and provide feedback on, on the project, improvements that they would like to see, things that they didn't like. Obviously we have a couple options um, with in terms of the mill race and things like that. And they'll be able to give some public, out, some public input on that. From that form and from those comments that we receive, we'll be preparing obviously just a public comment log, which will be just a basic summary of every comment we get will be published and not interpreted, but published word for word as provided, just like you typically see um, with other public, in other public comment processes. We'll try to do a FAQ summary of comments. Obviously, we're assuming that some of the comments will be sort of in groups and together and you know, they'll be worded differently, but the same intent. What we'll be doing is consolidating those into sub, um, things and then providing our response, whether it's an explanation or if it's a question or a misrepresentation of the project or whether maybe it will actually change the design of the project. We'll be actually providing our responses to those and that will be published as a document. And then we'll be looking to do another webinar or at least a written document about how we actually took the public comment that we got and integrated into that final master plan. 
we're looking to have you know this sort of final deliverables be completed. That looks like the comment period will end on August seventh, and um, we'll be looking to have this you know finished in September because it is our goal to get in front of the Forest Preserve Board, which is the final ask for this project, to actually get the Forest Preserve's permission to remove the dam and implement the master plan at Salt Creek sometime in early September or in late September um, would be our, our general timeline. Now, as Dave kind of said, um, we're doing this public outreach needs to happen on both fronts. We have, we need to get this out and this is what we're asking you guys. Steven, did you send that email yesterday that we worked on? You're muted. You are muted. <laughs> Every time. Um It'll be going out this morning. Okay, so we really need you guys as help as members to get this information out. Um, and so we've created a bunch of different things that we can help support you guys in getting that word out. We're not just talking, we're talking about to your mayors and your elected officials, to your other staff, because there's a lot of people who are talking about this project and you guys as members who have this project in your special condition should be, they should be familiar, be able to at least direct people to the proper information on the project. Um, as well as if you have any online social media presence or um, newsletters, electronic newsletters going out, we have materials for you. Because right now we're really trying to push to get people to register for these open houses to come learn more about the project. Um, and we're doing everything um, from our website at Restore Salt Creek. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this presentation and I'm going to open up the website um, and show you guys that. Can you guys see the website? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Let me share. I think I have to share the other screen. Hold on. Stop share. Share screen. Now you can see the website? Yep. Okay. So this is our website at restoresaltcreek.org. This is the home, the landing homepage. You can see um, we, have, we have the rendering. We have a little bit about our virtual open houses. Um, from this site, you can download a flyer um, to that, that advertises the open houses. We have a fact sheet that I'll show you separately, and it tells you how to participate. It has the exact the direct links that you can click on and register. We really encourage you guys to register for these and to get, you know, get this information to get out um, to, your mem to your local officials as well as your residents about these webinars. Some of the things that we've talked about, and we talked about this last time, we've actually gone ahead and um, we have some videos that help explain that. So we have a short presentation that sort of summarizes what Steven said today. So people can really learn a little bit about the science behind the master plan and what the ecological needs and goals are for the project. As you guys know, we did a big a public opinion research early on in this project that sparked, that showed us that there was interest in actually moving forward with the project. You can watch a video where Pete from Aileron talks about that. We also have these um, getting to know the DRSCW. Dave, this is you, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. This, yes. This is sort of a little bit about the DRSCW because we're not a name that gets out there. Um, there's also links to um, other articles. There's obviously a lot of press going on about dam removals, both our projects as well as in the region. So we're sharing that, showing that this is not an independent and unique project, that this is part of a greater, um, greater issue. And then once we get in, obviously, the re this public comment will move up. The registration will move up once we kind of get into that section. Some of the other things that will be helpful for you guys as um, residents to see is that we have um, this FAQ. Did it change? Just so I know. Yep, we, we see it. <laughs> Sorry. I've never done this before, so I just want to make sure. And what we have is an FAQ. And these are kind of those all those questions that sort of come up that people ask, like, why are we doing this? who's paying for it, you know, who owns the project. And they're just little brief discussions that you can read that sort of answer all those quick questions. And this is a great resource for people who are getting bombarded with questions from the public who want to know. They can either direct people here or they could, um, or they could, you know, hopefully read it and be able to provide some summary examples. We're working on providing some more pictures of some of the other projects that were done, Oak Meadow, the county um, projects at Warrenville and McDowell, things like that. And then we have a project partner page, and that project partner page um, is some of the folks that have already told us that they are supportive of the project, and we're sharing their um, logos. And so right now, it's been the Sierra Club and Prairie River Center Salt Creek. Um, we have some um, prairie, we have some canoeists and some um, other paddling groups that have this on their board meeting in order to be able to officially come out and endorse the project. And as we keep getting more of these, 
we're going to keep beefing up this section, but it sort of shows that this is not just a DRSW project, that there are partners out in the watershed that can, um, that are interested in helping this project. Um, so I have two questions. So Holly, um, in terms of the limit to the number of people who are joining the open houses, we have an account right now that allows for 500 per webinar. So we are hoping we will be okay with those limits. Um, I don't think that we'll have any more. <laughs> if we have more than that, we can, uh, we can upgrade to the thousand, but right now we're set at that 500 and we'll be able to do that instantaneously. So people, if we get more than 500, right now I have like 25 in one and 36 in the other. So still plenty of opportunities for you guys to get out there and register. And Talia, I'll answer your next question in a couple, in a couple of the information that I have um, coming up to show you guys about how, how we've actually come up with exact, like we've come up with example language that you guys can use um, for these, um, for some of promoting these events. So this is the website. Um, click on the restore Salt Creek to get back home. We think it looks pretty good, but if anyone has any questions um, or um, on the website, um, let us know. But I think we think it's a great research to really help answer some of those preliminary questions about the project. I'm gonna stop sharing this and go back to um, this. So that's the website and we've kind of talked about through all, all those. And then the last thing is um, additional outreach materials. Is So we know that it's hard for you guys and to all you know develop everything. So what we've done is um, we've created um, some additional materials and we can walk through some of them, but like we have a fact sheet. The fact sheet is um, two pages front and back. So it's four total pages of text. Here's the first page of it. This sort of walks through all of this stuff that we've talked about today. Um, you yeah, probably are not it. looking at that, right? Because I didn't share the right screen. Hold on. Sorry. Share screen. Back here. Sorry about that. It's like going back and forth. So what we've developed is we have um, a fact sheet. And here's the fact sheet. And I'll show you where you can get this fact sheet. We have the flyer. We also have written an e-blast. So we have an e-blast text that sort of summarizes and has pictures and, and I can show you that in a second that sort of tells you about the project and has that call to action to register for the open, your open houses um, to call for things. And then we're working on, we should have these finished date like social media posts, which I think I can move you guys like that. You can see them over here on the right hand side of the screen. There'll be JPEG files that you guys can just post, you know, with a little bit of text, but just to your Facebook pages that has the website that talks about the project. We have all sorts of different takes on these. We have ones that are very recreational heavy. We have ones that are very ecological heavy, very fish, fish, you know, fishermen aimed at fishermen. We have some general ones. We have ones that really focus on the economic impact to the project. I think Leah did an amazing job and created like 15 of them for us. So yes, there's all different did. options and different takes that you could have that we'll be able to share with you guys that you guys can just look and download those. And what, how I've done this is I figured the easiest way, because some of these are big, is they're all just within a OneDrive file. And Stephen's going to be sending you an email today that has all of these in there. And what you will have is you will get a link. Can you see my OneDrive account? Yes, we can. You'll get a link and this is what it is. And you can, you'll be able just to come right here and we have two versions of the fact sheet. We have a compressed version that's small if you want to email it. The master, the main one is large, but it has slightly better quality pictures. So you would just be able to, you know, click here and download this to your desktop and then you would have that item. The flyer is here. Um, in the eblast folder, I have it. Um, there's like the photos that were used in case you need to reallocate them. There's a Word version of it that you can cut and paste. There's a PDF in case that's easier for you guys to use. Um, I have, all, so what we have in here is I have the renderings. And so we do have the renderings that are pulled out of the, um, I don't know if I can click on them, if I open them, what happens? I have the renderings that are pulled out in case you wanted to print out some of your own materials. The renderings are in there where you can just open them up and they're not on those plan sheets. They're just the images in case you wanted to use them for something else. Um, some of our other partners were interested in just having access to those, which is why those are in there. But you have the renderings and they're titled. You'll be able to see we have like the project corridor. We have all the stream restoration fixture, features and a couple of the different images um, in there that you might find useful um, to share. These are a lot of these are also in that fact sheet. 
Um, and then once we get them, Leo has loaded them, but here's like the, um, the JPEGs of the, um, of the, um, of the um, social media thing. So here's like, here's the one that's sort of like about the recreational opportunities. So you can just come in here and look at them and then download them as you need. And we really encourage you to use these and we hope that it's been helpful that you guys, that we have this and I guess I can, um, you know, that's, that's pretty much where we are. This is what we have now. And then the e-blasts in the, the e-blast right now is really set up, here's like a PDF of it, is really set up to, you know, talks about the highlights and stuff like that. And then has, you know, some text for the call to action. You don't have to use it all, but some of it, all the text in here is in here to help you guys create what you need, what you need to be sharing with your folks. We'll update some of this after the public meetings. Right now, the call to action is to get people to register for the open houses and get them looking at the website and get them thinking about the project. And then after July 7th, we'll have another round of all of these things that'll be produced and shared with you guys. Because the next round will be getting people to start commenting on the project and submitting that comment form and showing their support for the project. It's gonna be very important for us to show um, the support, um, the sh so the support for these, for these, um, for this project. And so we're gonna, we don't just want comments about people who don't like it. We want our supporters to really get in and you guys as municipal um, representatives, as special condition holders to go ahead and comment on the project. You know, it's sort of think that you, since you're a member of the community, that means that your vote's sort of being shown to support the project, but it's really important for you guys to participate in this process and um, keep pushing this. Stephen and I wrote a letter, a memo, um, that you that the special condition holders will be getting that sort of talks about who to target within your agency and how to use some of these resources. Um, you know, pretty much what I said today, but in writing. <laughs> um, and Stephen has that going out today. Stephen, do you have anything to add to this or anything else you want um, to know? Yeah, I, I do have one thing to add. But before going into that, I just want to reinforce the point is that we, you know, we have been talking to people pretty much nonstop for the last three weeks but we can't talk to everybody. Um, I alone have talked to nearly a dozen people who have signed the, the anti-project, that's the do not take out the dam petition. And every single person I've talked to on that subject has told me I wished I hadn't signed the petition now. So the petition is not there to give people a balanced sort of view of the pros and cons of this project. It is there, you know, it elicits an emotional response from them. And we need all of you to, to, you know, we're not looking to convince that you're going to argue with people around, but we're looking that you put the facts in people's hands, tell them where to go for additional information, and make sure that they at least understand that there are very large public benefits to be had uh, from this project. I, I would say the, the, the second thing that perhaps we didn't dwell on so much today is to talk about the, the nature of the, the dam itself. Um, so phrase uh, the historic uh, dam at at uh, Grand Mill. Well, you know, it, is it historic? It, it is a historic to the the mill building. Uh, the dam that is there now was constructed in the 1930s, while the um, uh, the mill itself was constructed mid 19th century. Um, so, you know, considerably after that, it is not of a style of dam that would have been in place with the mill. It is not constructed of materials that would have been used to construct the dam that went with the mill, and it is not even the same shape and size as the dam that would have been used to drive the mill. In fact, as we were looking over the topographic and bathymetric information and in conversations with people very familiar with running the mill, um, that dam really is not adequate to, to run the mill. It can only do so periodically. Um, the difference, the head differential between the crest and the raceway are a few, it's a few inches. It's not, that is not sufficient to keep a large flow in the raceway through all kinds of weather patterns and then provide enough energy to drive the mill wheel, which is an undershot wheel, which is a very efficient, inefficient kind of wheel, um, to drive it. Now, the mill wheel itself is not connected to the internal gears of the mill. Um, it, it cannot be connected, in fact, um, and it could not drive that gearing. It, it doesn't have enough energy to drive the load off the gears even if it was. So there's three feet of concrete between that, that drive shaft and the internal cogs of the, of the mill. Um, the mill itself is run from an electric motor which is mounted inside the mill building. 
So the current system, it, it, it does create an illusion, which is very pleasing, but I think it's important that people have the facts that um, this project makes no difference to the ability to drive that wheel or, or any of the gearing inside the mill. Uh, that is, it, it, we are looking at putting in an independent system which will allow flow in there. I will investigate if we can get that flow to a point where perhaps the, the mill wheel can be turned more consistently than it is, is currently. We can't say that with confidence at the moment, but that is something that we will be, will be looking at. Um, I think once again, I mean, I'm very interested in history and historical buildings, et cetera, but I think it's, we have to be very clear what we're talking about and just not say that this is, this is history versus taxpayer dollars and environment. It, it's much more complicated than that. The, uh, you know, the, the, we can say that there is a, a newer dam on the footprint of an older dam at the site. That's, that's probably is the, the, the least controversial reading of all of these bits and pieces we can get. But I think it's important that all of our members are aware and can talk lucidly about that matter. Yeah, so I think the kind of the big takeaways for that, just to sort of summarize, is that you will hear a lot talk about the grist mill um, being powered by the water and the dam, and that's what grinds the corn. That is not true. The grist mill is a separate system, as Stephen said. It's been powered by electricity at least since the 90s. I'm not 100% sure on when that comp, when that actually was actually separated, but it's done by an electrical switch that actually powers the the, the actual grinders that grind the corn at the part of the history decision. So that's what. The second is, is that people, you'll hear a lot of people say that the wheel is, that people know the mill is open when the wheel is turning, which is a very over-exaggeration of the current state at the site. Because as Stephen mentioned, the dam is about four feet lower than it would be to actually have sufficient flow through that raceway. There is an artificial system that creates some power, that creates some movement of that wheel at certain times. Once that raceway starts to fill with sediment, like it has now, they had we had heard from the, in a conversation with the miller that wheel has not turned in about a year because the sediment gets too full through that raceway and we don't have enough hydraulic pressure and head to actually turn that wheel. Yeah. So we're looking and, to to help keep the visual of that race of water being that raceway that being in water. But when you hear some of those facts, they are not one hundred percent true, <laughs> and we yeah. just want you guys to be aware and be able to educate people on there that the mill grinding of the gears is a completely separate electrical system. It is not, the wheel is no longer even, cannot, is no longer even physically turned. The gear has been removed from that wheel. That wheel is just a free turning structure. And when it turns, it just, it doesn't power or move anything. It just turns. The, and, and none of this is to in any way suggest, you know, any views on the mill building or anything like that. The, the group that runs the mill has done an amazing job of keeping a piece of industrial heritage. Uh, alive. Um, but what we're just trying to do is these are the facts. And when we're talking about such large sums of money from public investment that are not really going to solve the problem, it's very important that we're talking about what, what is real, not what, uh, you know, not what people are running to um, in terms of like, you know, your first assumption is, well, water is going through the raceway, it's turning the, 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 the wheel, and that's turning the gearing. That's something that seems worth preserving. Um, but that is not the case. So that is what we're putting out here. I think that's everything I had on the subject. In case, if anybody wants to speak up, I saw there was a question here from Julie Lomax about pointing out that there are two FAQs. Yeah, uh, I'm looking right now to see. There must just be a duplicate. I'm, I can't. I'll have to check. I'll have Leah check on that. And then Scott has a question. I don't know if he wants me to turn on his mic. His hand is raised. Um, Matt was also you. asking if we're all on mute, and yes, we are. Um, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Hey, Scott. Okay, yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, hey, no, the uh, toolbox looks wonderful, thanks for that. And um, one, one thing I thought I'd just uh, is worth bringing up is this whole change.org petition against uh, removal of the dam, I think, <clears throat> needs to be uh, taken with a bit of a grain of salt. I mean, I, you can use that, that it's got a bad reputation and for giving false impressions of momentum. Uh, when when, it, when you, I think I heard somebody say there was an impassioned plea uh, put out and an effective one, but you know, what happens is that goes to a handful of friends who then, <clears throat> who then uh, if I get that, will then broadcast it to my friends if I feel strongly about it. And 
you know, I've got 300 friends, most of which are on the East Coast. And, hey, uh, you know, sign this for me. And, and pretty soon you've got a lot of people who may or may not even know anything about it or even have used the resource that are signing a, position, uh, a petition for their friends. So I, while I think it's a data point, uh, I do think we've got to be careful about, you know, taking it with a grain of salt and um, looking at, you know, keeping your eye on the ball. So anyway, change.org is, is a bit of a sore point. I, I feel like it's something just a little short of a scam, if, particularly when they ask for money, you know, for uh, it, that making it look like they're taking the money for the cause when they're just putting it in their own pocket. They've got a bad reputation. Okay. Thanks, Scott. I would also add that the, the colliery to, to, the, to that, the petition is, we did the um, public outreach in terms of running a, a questionnaire, which set out both the pros and the cons, and we had independent help to make sure that we were not pitching. In fact, I remember we tore up everything we did because we felt it was too, it was too leading for our argument. So we tried to make it as neutral as possible. 80% of people, when they were faced with the, pro, or the cost benefit of the project in that questionnaire, said the project should go ahead. I don't remember the number of people interviewed, but obviously it's a more representative cross section of the community. There were people in, there were people in DuPage, um, and uh, they, were, um, they were presented with the project as, as opposed to just you know, stop this or do that. It was saying, here's something that might be done. Here are the pros and cons. What do you think? So that was an 80% uh, approval rating on that. So that's, I think, the answer to the change.org one-sided petition type uh, argument. Yep. Scott, Scott, I don't know if you know this, but do you know if that, if somebody was to ask this group if they could get us the demographics on who signed that petition, is that something that they could provide? Does change.org provide that to the owner of the petition? Uh, well, you know, that's a good question because, uh, Dion, I was thinking, that I was asking myself the same question back when, uh, if, if I heard it right, you said 9,000 people have signed uh, the petition uh -huh. against, against removal of the dam, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would like to try to find that out, although I think whoever started that petition would probably not be really willing to share that if, we, if, if they did. Somebody other than us who might have more, if somebody other than us who is making a decision on the project or in, interested could ask them and they could and they could decide if they wanted to provide that or not. But it's a valid question to ask. Yeah, it is. And, um, but, you know, I don't mind looking into that because I just, I think it would be, it would be good information to know or at least to know whether you could get it or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Dennis had asked me to ask you that, so. I was yeah, no, it's good. Good, good question. I wasn't even aware of them until, you know, I don't know, the last month or so when all this started rolling. But gosh, they really, uh, you know, somebody put a really nice, with the right intention, put a nice counter petition out on change.org for, for removal of the dam. And it was well written. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it puts people off, too, as soon as they go and ask for money that yes. you have no idea where it's going. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Um, so I think that covers everything that we needed to say, at least I need to say on this effort today, unless anybody has any other questions, but we really encourage you to use these materials. And if you're having issues with OneDrive, you guys will get that link today in an email. Just contact me and I can get you guys what you need. I can even email them to you, but there's just so many that I thought it'd be easier to put it in a shareable site for you guys. Yeah, and I say the the email will be going out later today with the with the link and some instructions of what we hope think you should uh, you know things that people you should contact and make sure that they get the uh, the information. Okay, with uh, with that, we'll move on to we have other business. <laughs> yeah, that was that was terrific. Thank you. Um, and and do contact your leaders before they sign that petition because um, I. I Got involved in social media in the comments of uh, one of the, I won't say who, but elected leader. And I simply posted, please everyone go to RestoreSaltCreek.org to see the facts on this river restoration project. And that kind of put the kibosh on, on that. Um, there were a lot of 
impassioned, uh, uninformed comments before that. So it kind of got a life of its own, but let's just feed people uh, to the, the site where they can get facts. Yeah. And as Scott pointed out, it creates this sense of momentum, but we don't know those could be people from Arizona or Massachusetts posting on there. Um, you know, people get to think, oh, my friend likes this, sure, I'll jump in on it too. Okay, let's talk about the permit special conditions. Okay. Dina, do you want to, can we pull the, the um, agenda up on? Yeah, I have the agenda. Let me just share my screen. I have it. I, I, that's what I was actually looking at. So <laughs> I will make you guys go away. And then you should have the agenda here now, right? Yep. Okay. Okay. So um, the, uh, we'll hit high points in this. So we are in discussions with our environmental partners about the, um, uh, permit negotiation. Our permit is scheduled to run for another five years. We have asked our environmental partners to um, to work with us to extend our current permit the condition out for another cycle. Uh, this would allow another uh, a number of things to be done, especially expanding the Lower East Branch project and also looking at the old Oak Brook Dam upstream of the um, uh, Fullersburg Woods Dam. Um, uh, once again, using the, the same points, um, there, I would say that that discussion is ongoing with the EAGs and obviously we're up against the wire, which I have underlined for them, that we need a decision now. The part of this is also comes down to that the, the work group in the Lower DuPage group had a special call out in the three party agreement with IAWA. And I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think that I've redirected our, um, some of our EAG partners to go back and look at that document uh, to remind themselves um, of that because it, it in some ways is complicating uh, this discussion. Um, okay, moving on then. And, um, can you cover one thing on that though? I've had, some people have asked that they've seen the draft Downers Grove permit and can you just explain yes. what yeah. has happened and what's going on with that? Yeah, so so that permit came out, uh, the um, IEPA had agreed to sit on permits and obviously they're kind of all working from home and not necessarily all at the same office at the moment and uh, the um, one of the permit writers went ahead and sent that out uh, and we immediately contacted IEPA to say that they had agreed to sit on it for a piece and they agreed so they they're holding on to that at the moment so there should be no other permits coming out at this moment um, uh, so I think that that covers it yeah it was a it was a bit of a miscommunication internally at IEPA Okay, uh, physical project update. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about Oak Meadows. Uh, Faywell Dam modification. Um, we are currently working on a proposal, hoping to have it um, perhaps at the end of the week in draft format, which would cover the new proposal, um, detailed scope on that, uh, what that would look like, uh, total costs for that, what the permitting would look like. We've already started talking to some of the permitting agencies. Um, and this then would be, once it's approved by the projects committee, would go to, um, it would go to County Stormwater for approval. If County Stormwater approves it, they are the owner of the, of the uh, Faywell Dam. If they approve it, then it would go to the board, DRCW board for approval for funding. And at that point, then construction would start um, uh, on the item. We, we're pursuing permitting at this time. Um, uh, largely just we're hoping to get this through on a um with any without any um uh, well we're hoping to sort of take a shortcut on, on the permitting i'll give you more details on that once it it looks at it, because we're not modifying we're not adding fill to the um uh to the riverway or the floodplain or the floodway and uh there, there's some hope that we can get this um get this done on a a um on a truncated timeline in terms of of that Part of it will be regrading off the riffle downstream of the dam. This is necessary because we need to drop water levels um, in order to create enough uh, flow at the where the mouth of the fish ramp would be to in order to track the fish to that to that location. Um, but that proposal, you should be seeing that uh, very soon. Once again, this was necessitated after there were worries that the uh, growing mill dam would not survive the modification process that we had initially proposed uh, to it. Uh, or rather the Faywell Dam would not survive that, that process. Yeah. You can see like a growing male dam on the, on the brain. Um, 
We have already covered the Growing Mill Dam. We Why have it's... one motion that needs to be done as part of the Growing Mill. Yes, we do. Uh, we've already been through this stuff um, pretty uh, extensively, but if you go to the final part of the Growing Mill Dam item, you'll see a budget amendment there. Um, staff made a proposal to the board uh, in the last few weeks that we needed to hire a, um, some help to put some video clips together. If you look at the, uh, because we were moving to this online type of condition, we were holding these virtual meetings, what we wanted was canned presentations, basically versions of the presentations that you saw this morning, but also who is the DRSCW, and we also have a couple of public works departments who are, who are impacted directly by, um, by the water quality problems created by uh, the Growing Mill Dam. Uh, putting on there that it's important to their village and their local constituents that this project happened. Um, this was, um, uh, we also purchased the, uh, put up a DRCW account for Zoom. It's what we're using right now, but this was principally done before we were using the TCF system. Uh, this was done because we, the, we were these public meetings out because of the duration and the size of the public meetings, we needed some extra um, uh, capacity. Uh, so. Um, that was $500 for the uh, two months. And that gives us capacity up to 500 people on each one of those two public meetings that we had announced. The other 6,000 there is for hiring Sickage, which is a company that we've worked with before on putting together uh, video, video content. And it's been a, a real pleasure working with them on this. Uh, the board authorized us, uh, the board is authorized to do uh, items that are not in the budget up to $10,000. Uh, this came to 6,500 um, and our proposal to the board was that would come out of the um, contingency fund in the budget, uh, special conditions and moved into the Fullersburg Wood Outreach Plan. I believe uh, offhand it was $200,000 we have in that contingency fund. So 6,500 moved from the contingency fund into the Fullersburg Wood Outreach uh, line item. And um, the board has already authorized this, but we're looking for approval that the that that money was moved from the contingency fund into the um, uh, special condition uh, Fullersburg Wood outreach line item. Right. So that's technically a budget amendment. So that's what we're voting on is is the budget amendment to move the sixty five hundred from the special contingency fund to the Fullersburg Woods outreach project fund. So uh, if we can have some hands to make that motion. Uh, okay, I see uh, Jennifer has made the motion, Jennifer Hammer, and second by Dennis Stryker. And if we can have the poll for the vote, please. Dina, can we get some elevator music for this? In the well, I mean, meetings? people voted way more quickly for this one than they did for our minute. So we are actually good. <laughs> <laughs> I will go ahead and end that poll. Stephen can sing next time. Yeah, trust me, you do not want that. <laughs> yeah, let's get the elevator music. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, oh, dang, <laughs> it's wounded. All right, thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, uh, next at Springbrook phase two, uh, as we've, we have our MOU signed with the Forest Preserve District, that project is looking to be completed at, in, in fall. Once again, uh, heavy rains last year, COVID-19 lockdown have really uh, stressed that project out, but it is, the parts of it that are complete are looking excellent. Uh, and, and perhaps um, we will look at having a, um, course, or work with the Forest Preserve to try to put together uh, perhaps a field visit, uh, have one of our, um, either an off schedule meeting or a meeting out there in order to, uh, to look at the, the project. Um, no updates on lower east branch, lower west branch. Um, so we'll move into nutrient implementation uh, policy, implantation policy, implementation. Okay. Uh, spelled wrong. <laughs> yeah, I know. I just, I, I, it's funny how many times you review it and don't see it, but. Um, yeah. Okay. Implanting something that might be way, that might be my solution. Maybe you just want to call it NIP from now on. Everyone knows. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there actually there's no real update except for um, in the really into the um, 
Qual 2 um, K modeling update. We are, we're moving great on that. We're working with Tetra Tech. They're staying on that. We should have um, some validation um, and calibration runs for the um, East Branch um, within the next couple weeks. Um, and then we are working heavily on getting the data necessary for to start the setup of the other two models. So the other three models, because we're working with the lower D page on that. So we are um, moving full speed ahead on that project, even with the COVID issues. I don't know if you want to talk about the leaf litter work in the IPS. Yeah, just, just one item off it. Um, we've had a great opportunity uh, because of the COVID-19 lockdown. Uh, there were some uh, uh, brainy consultants that were, um, were due to start projects that have been prolonged. And V3 approached us about it. They had a GIS uh, expert who was, um, whose project had not started and wondered if we had any projects that he could assist us on. So he is pulling together information out of our um, spatial analysis that went with the IPS tool, and he is he is lining it up to work on the um, this leaf litter analysis. So he's putting together the database that then we will be using. We'll have to decide how that database will be employed, and that's something we'll talk about. The staff are going to have a talk about this, and then we'll be bringing that to the projects committee. But just big thanks to V3 for helping us with this. Uh, they're also helping. Ex uh, gather the spatial information for the lower displays work group that would then be allow them to produce their own um, outputs from the IPS model that we've been working on. So uh, thanks to V3 for that assistance. Um, IPS, uh, Dina, anything on the expanded DO? Just that I'm working with Alex and we're going to start sampling, you know, it's sort of that mid July. So we're getting, we're getting up on it. So we're, we have meet, we have a meeting scheduled on Monday with Jennifer Hammer to coordinate the two sampling between us and the, and Hickory Creek. And we're going to just get it. We're ready to kick that off as soon as we um, yeah. can. And, and, and when uh, Dean is talking to Hickory Creek, what we find is that we're sharing a lot of resources between work, uh, lots of work groups who are working on NIPs, NARPs and such, and we're collecting a lot of the same information. So we're replicating uh, the methodologies and it's just a, it's more efficient way for everybody to get the information together uh, that we're going to need to populate that uh, NIP. Um, IPS update. I am hoping to get documents from MBI today uh, on a draft final document on the, um, on the uh, IPS. We did have a meeting or a uh, projects committee meeting where we discussed the uh, IPS peer review and um, for Kaiser and Associates and we had a very good discussion about uh, pretty heavy science subjects with between uh, MBI staff and the Kaiser and Associates staff. But it was uh, always a privilege to sit in and listen to people of that caliber talk about this kind of thing. But the general finding of Kaiser and Associates was that the IPS tool was robust. It was uh, empirically based, data supported, and they felt it was a, a, a good tool for planning our, our next, um, next steps on. They did point out some things that we may want to do in terms of um, uh, calibrating uh, effort. This is specifically to do with nutrients, uh, algae, phosphorus, and, and such. Um, and we'll be looking at that and integrating those into our NIP and NARPs. So for some of our newer members, IPS, um, it's- yeah, so, so, yeah, so the IPS is the uh, Project um, Identification and Prioritization System. It is basically a statistical model, uh, which is built on our um, now, you know, 15 years of data gathering. And it, 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 it looks at data, originally it looked at data and tried to sort it out into uh, creating a statistically robust explanation for why, uh, biodiversity, um, sorry, uh, why biodiversity was uh, lacking or was present in the streams. In other words, the variation in biodiversity, why that was happening. Um, the new tool <clears throat> still does that, but in fact, it can be, it can run in multiple directions, meaning it can, it can also look at where interventions in nutrients, for example, would be most um, profitable in the stream. In other words, in terms of improving uh, aquatic life, so it isn't limited simply to the principal stressors. It can also look at various levels of substressors, including things like habitat, landscape interventions. So if you, you know, if you wanted to know like what was the interventions of tweaking wastewater treatment plant effluent or what are the 
implications of improving winter de-icing, et cetera, or stream habitat, all of those, the IPS tool with a few tweaks, now I can start generating information <clears throat> on what that would look like. So uh, I've, I've called it just a complex multiple regression analysis. Uh, that seemed to be good enough. I, I, I did watch that uh, YouTube video. I think all members should. Um, that, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. That is how we are, are identifying and selecting our projects for the biggest bang for the buck. Um, so if you're asked why this project, not, not some other project, why, how are we identifying what to do in each watershed, this is the tool. Um, so at least once a year, Dina and I have been going down to meet with IEPA. We have not done that this year for uh, reasons that are obvious to everybody. Um, Bioassessment, uh, we have um, final Salt Creek report. Uh, they are making the final tweaks now. I have asked them to not do those tweaks until the IPS document, it's the same staff working on these, until that IPS document is finalized, that is priority and they, that is what they have done. Um, uh, the 2019 report is, um, basic, is underway. We have already received information from that report and this was integrated into the uh, uh, municipal county uh, MS4 report. So this, is, this covers the watershed monitoring um, water quality uh, monitoring aspects of, of that report. Uh, we are starting the West Branch bioassessment. Um, contracts have been signed, uh, which are in line with our um, budgeted amounts for this in terms of chemistry and uh, biology and habitat uh, for the 2020 uh, sampling season. A um, couple of things just for interest for members on the Upper Salt Creek uh, 319 plan. Um, this is not related to that, but if you are in a watershed that has a 319 plan as the um, uh, lower Salt Creek does, this we're talking about the 319 plan there because we have put in a, uh, for financial assistance to help preparing that plan, but the lower Salt Creek already has a plan. Um, that plan, a, it, there's projects that are fundable under that plan and um, the, uh, Sorry, I'm getting some sign from coming in from outside. The, uh, you can put in for grants starting in, uh, now the, the documentation is available at the IEPA website. You can go there, get that documentation. Grants are due on August 3rd. That's the application for those grants is due if you want a 319 grant, or I believe the green infrastructure grant is also on the same deadline. Um, so if you are interested in getting a 319 grant for 2021, uh, start downloading that documentation now and getting it filled in. You have to be pre-qualified, um, so you'll want to get that process um, started as soon as possible. If you're a DRCW member and you're working through this, um, I'm not saying Dean and I are going to help you put together the whole thing, but you can contact us in terms of uh, you know knowing where to get the information and and whatnot. Uh, just looking through our. Item 10, already covered, a um, lot of that. Uh, once again, thanks to County Stormwater and to our, a lot of our municipal members for working on the dissolved oxygen uh, uh, ongoing monitoring. Um, chlorides, uh, so we have workshops scheduled for October 15th, 14th, 15th, and October 8th. Um, so, uh, Sorry, I just had a growy mill dam thing come into my computer. Always, uh, my my uh, antenna are always uh, up for that. The um, we are looking at, and the pro, uh, the chloride committee will be discussing perhaps moving these to virtual online items. Um, also talking to some of the other groups in the area about um, about how this could be done. My original thought was, well, you know, if they're online, then you know perhaps we could all band together and do it. But it seems like uh, some of the consultants are suggesting that they would still limit the number of people at these online seminars because there's question and answer periods and they just cannot manage the flow of traffic. So this would be a, this is something that we're gonna to have, to, uh, to have to look at. Uh, we have a grant application from the city of Elmhurst to the Illinois Tollway. It has been prepared. I have it with the city of Elmhurst at the moment for final review. 
And we are also assisting the Illinois Tollway with documentation of the Bensonville and Wooddale grants in terms of what the impacts of the updated BMPs at those villages have been on the efficiencies of um, winter de-icing compound application rates at, uh, from those villages. Um, Time-limited water quality standard for chlorides in our neighbors to the east. Uh, this is in the uh, cause and displaying systems. Um, we've had a lot of questions from groups there about monitoring from chlorides because we've been doing it for a while, how it can be done using conductivity, et cetera, what's important, winter versus summer, et cetera. And we've been assisting, uh, talking to MWRD and to our environmental partners uh, about that. Um, hoping by the next meeting, we will have some outputs by our, um, from our loading study. This is looking at the long-term trends of chloride in the DuPage and Salt Creek systems. Um, we did have some stuff already to look at, but obviously we want to focus on Grawy Mill Dam at this, at this time. Um, and then the street sweeping thing, we were looking at chlorides being picked up. This was halted because of the uh, shelter in place order. Uh, we just couldn't get the organization done to pull that together. Okay, I think we can go on to uh, business items. Uh, this is a table of invoices that have been approved by project chairs the uh, board are the um, executive board and by staff. So the, the process is staff reviews, checks that it's in budget. They do sort of the, um, uh, you know, ground level, look at, it, 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 you know, about is the work being completed? Is the, um, this is with, uh, within scope, et cetera. Uh, we then pass that up to a committee chair who checks over uh, that we've done that correctly and asks any, uh, any questions they feel needs to be asked. It then goes to the executive board for, uh, for final approval. So all of these items, unless otherwise noted for a, um, uh, are, are, were covered in our budget that were approved in 2000, uh, or at the beginning of the year. Um, so uh, they're here for your information. Once again, any questions on those, please direct, uh, direct those questions uh, to me. Uh, Dave, anything else about that? No, uh, well said. We everything is within budget, and so uh, that's why the board is is uh, approving them, and the membership does not have to vote on each of them. The uh, financial reports. I, I'm not going to uh, pull them up and look at them, but they are attached to your document. If anyone has questions, they can ask them here, or as always, I am available uh, all uh, all the time to answer any questions about any of those financial reports. Uh, one one item actually that I did miss that we could go back to, I think I have it in the table. Um, yeah, just, just a couple of things to, to note there is uh, we are, the hack agreement that you can see, Dina, if you could just put the cursor over that, there is, uh, that is an annual payment that we do for, this is like a, a bench service agreement for maintenance of our dissolved oxygen songs. It comes due once a year, that's not an ongoing payment. Uh, we moved forward and got both. They come in at different times of the year. We went ahead and paid both uh, as we had a couple of songs that were in need of uh, repair. Uh, the other item I'd like to note there is our um, audit, uh, Letterman and, and a man. Uh, that audit is largely complete. Uh, myself and Larry Cox on the, um, on the executive committee are just giving it a final review. And then that will be going out on the website and you'll receive an update that when it's on the website, if you want to go and look at that audit, we perform that audit uh, every year. Uh, last item is our general liability insurance. Uh, we actually changed our insurance a little bit um, to, to cover some additional items. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's good, Dean. It was in, it was in the table too. Uh, I'd like to thank um, Dino uh, Defanis of the village of Itasca. Uh, he, we were doing a lot of, second guessing on what our insurance policy should look like. He really um, looked, he, he took some time to look at what we needed to do, give us um, advice on what we needed to do. Very, it was very focused, actionable advice. And I um, uh, just I really want to thank him for taking the time to do that. There was no cost to the work group. He did it pro bono. And uh, thanks again to him for, for his help on that. Uh, all right, membership dues and payments. <clears throat> it was one up, Dina. Um, so uh, these have gone out. Uh, the financial reports and this piece of the item does, uh, or rather the membership dues payments does reflect through to June 11th. Uh, we have had received several payments since that date. 
Um, so uh, I will be going into the office later today to lodge those, but they're not showing up at the moment because uh, they simply haven't uh, been moved into our bank account. They will show up on the next, uh, our, our next, at our next general meeting. Okay, so it, we can go down to the contract renewal for TCF. Okay, so the contract renewal for TCF, this is an annual item that we do at this, at this time of year. Um, uh, this has already gone to the board who've approved bringing it to the general membership for a vote. So this covers uh, my time, it covers Dina's time, it also covers uh, accountant uh, work at the at TCF. Uh, we have an accountant who works um, uh, it's um, two days a week uh, on this and we also have uh, our new hire Alex uh, who is working on um, the NIP and NARP items as well as uh, uh, <laughs> like everybody else on Grawy Mill uh, Dam uh, items. Um, so the, the budget item that is in there uh, which I'm not looking at at the moment it does match our uh, what is in our budget However, the fixed cost part of this has been increased, and that was increased with approval of the board, but it is coming to membership for approval. It was originally $12,000 a year. It has been increased to $15,000 a year. So this covers use of office equipment, office space, uh, and such. Uh, the reason for this was, was twofold. Uh, one is we did look at what it was like in the private sector, and um, clearly um, what um, DRCW is paying TCF, was beneath market rates, so it has been increased to match those market rates. The other item is uh, TCF policy has changed over the, over the last year, and they are, are looking that they are going to have a small multiplier, and by small multiplier, we're talking about, um, you know, uh, like a, a 0.2, so, a, uh, you know, 20% 20, uh, 20 on, on contracts. We were not at that level. We were pretty much operating, uh, it was a few percentage point, but pretty much at cost. Um, so this reflects that new policy at, at TCF. This does not quite bring us into line with that, but it, it does move us substantially towards meeting that, that goal. So the, the board did allow that increase from 12,000 to 15,000, which is $3,000 increase on that fixed line item. The salary item is exactly what we had um, authorized at the annual budget. Dave, anything to add? Um. No, we, we did keep it within budget and that's why we're not going to the full uh, 1.2 multiplier, but we do intend next year uh, with, uh, when we look at the annual budget to try to be in line with that. And that's, that will be the proposal at this point. We want to be fair to TCF. We see that uh, we have been getting a, a unreasonable deal on uh, the, the fixed cost. So um, we certainly have the board's uh, concurrence with that. So uh, another thing to mention, I think that we talked about before is that TCF is going to be uh, pitching in 2.5% of salary costs for uh, Stephen and Dina, just to cover some TCF uh, related duties. Uh, we, we do certainly align with uh, much of the mission of the TCF. So, um, so the board uh, recommends this contract. It does require a vote by the membership. And with that, I'd ask for a motion and a second, please. Unless there are any qu questions that can come through also. All right, we have a motion by Larry and a second by Sue. So we can take votes on that, please. Larry Cox and Sue Barrett. We are good. Thank you, guys. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next item, I'll, I'll handle that too, Stephen. Uh, we had a vacant position on the executive board and with, that was with the retirement of Nick Meninga from Downers Grove Sanitary District. And Amy Underwood has graciously agreed to take that position, to fill that position of the uh, village. Uh, the, uh, the board has voted to approve that appointment. And uh, so thank you to Amy and also especially thank you to Amy for taking over the uh, leadership of the, the projects committee, uh, which is a very busy uh, committee. So um, 
just want to welcome her aboard and make that announcement with everyone. Okay, anything to mention on the calendar, Stephen? Uh, yeah, well, you can see there, Dina did speak. Just want to point out, Dina spoke at the um, River Alley. It was a virtual conference this year, but she spoke on uh, TMDLs, Thinking Beyond Permit Limits. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a big national conference and uh, very proud of her getting, you know, um, not so, always, so easy to get on the agenda there. So, uh, um, Dina, any, any feedback or anything from the... I mean, we are one of the recorded presentations, so... I haven't heard from anybody, but <laughs> okay. still good. The, the other thing I would say is that we are working uh, on a newsletter and it will also be talking a lot about Grimeville Dam as that is the uh, item du jour. Uh, so uh, we'll be pulling that together. That will be published and that will be going out. And obviously that goes to mayor's managers and city administrators and, and such. So that's it. All right. And then the upcoming meeting schedule is noted. Um, probably see you all on Zoom uh, for the foreseeable future. Hope you're all doing well and uh, getting by in these weird times. So thank you for joining our meeting today. If we can have a motion to adjourn. Motion by Sue and second by Rich Salerno. So we are adjourned. Thank you all and uh, see you in a couple months. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Just us?